Okay, welcome back to another edition of The Orthodox Medievalist. And uh, we're going to talk at least in the first half of this program, if not uh, the second half, uh, we're going to talk about something that I know a lot of people, uh, historians, philosophers, my own listeners, um, uh, are interested in, and that is the gulag. And that is the system of so-called re-education camps, uh, which is what the Soviet acronym GULAG means, uh, what this system of re-education camps meant for the Soviet Union, for the Soviet economy, and what it means for us as people, you know, struggling in this rotten, uh, sick day and age. Uh, the Gulag, uh, we're going to talk, at least for this first half, we're going to talk between 1930 and 1950. 1930 and 1950, that 20 years is the very, uh, the very heart of, of the Gulag, uh, functioning and program, and it's really, it's just amazing to me that no matter what is said, no matter how many immigrants come over to America from Ukraine or Russia or wherever, that the Gulag never gets the kind of press that the Nazi uh, concentration camps get. It's really shocking. It's really unbelievable. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that the Gulag system throughout the Soviet Union is a part and parcel of Marxism as an ideology. You cannot say that, well, I'm a socialist on the one hand, but I don't believe in the Soviet Union on the other. That does not work. Uh, you could never say in polite society in America that, well, I'm kind of a national socialist, but I'm not really a Hitlerian. That's not how it works. And, and we can't allow that to work uh, in that respect as far as the Soviets are, are concerned. Uh, Marxism and the Marxist analysis is connected intrinsically and, and inextricably with the Soviet Union and with the Gulag system uh, in this period of time. Uh, equality, the way that Marx and his uh, friends in America understood it, equality means the Gulag. The Gulag means equality, and that has to be understood. And it's not going to happen anytime soon that the American education system, uh, as rotten as it is, is, is ever going to, to understand that. Uh, but, but let's be clear that in this 20 year period, uh, 1930, 1950, you have roughly 50 million inmates of the Gulag system. And this is not speculation. This is a result of the internal documents of the MVD. So, uh, there is there is no doubt that there are 50 million inmates in the gulag system in this period of time. But what I'm going to say, uh, first and foremost, is that you cannot understand the Soviet system, you cannot understand communism, you cannot understand the concept of equality in, in this sort of, you know, political and economic way, unless you understand the simple fact that the Soviet economy in this era was fueled by the Gulag system. This is something that I want you guys to, uh, I want you, I want this to sink in very clearly here. That the Soviet economy was fueled largely by slave labor. I'm not talking about necessarily the factory system or the, uh, so-called agricultural, um, uh, collective. I mean, these were slave labor systems as such. But, I mean, even the Gulag, I mean, apart from all of that, the Gulag system was a system of slave labor that was the very spine and heart of the Soviet economy. I mean, there were even anti-communists throughout the 30s and 40s who refused to believe this. But the fact is, is that the Gulag system was a way to make up for all of the shortfalls that um, the uh, sort of regular planned economy constantly had built into its institution. Without the gulag system, there was no Soviet economy. That means any analysis, and this includes CIA analysis in the 60s and 70s, any analysis of the Soviet economy makes no sense unless at least 60 or 70 percent of those numbers are attributed to the gulag system. And the very fact that an American academia 
that uh, uh, Marxist economics is taken seriously uh, really, you know, should tell you something about how they view this gulag system and really, you know, how they view what they want to do with you once they take over. So the first point that we need to make here is that the gulag system is the spine of the Soviet economy. It's not necessarily a method of punishment. It was that. It was a method of, of eliminating dissidents and all that kind of nonsense. But it's a lot more than that. That was a, that was a secondary element of the system. The gulag system was the very heart and soul of the Soviet economy. Without understanding the gulag system, you can't understand the Soviet Union. Furthermore, the second point I want to make here is that the gulag system was a system of forced labor a system of slavery. Now, that system of slavery existed as a means of re-education. You know, this is the same nonsense that all of these leftists, uh, you know, have made against the, the, the Nazi concentration camps. But explicitly speaking, in the archives of the MVD in the Soviet Union, the concept of the Gulag system, apart from its, you know, central economic role, the concept of the gulag system is based upon re-education. We will use the torture of forced labor to take those who reject the Soviet so-called revolution and make them partisans of that revolution. And I can't help, you know, every time, I, you know, I've lectured on this topic, I lectured on this topic at uh, Mount St. Mary's University where I was fired, and I lectured on this topic, and it's kind of funny that within a few days, after making the connection between the gulag system and American capitalism, I was removed from my position at Mount St. Mary's University, and I refuse to believe that there's, you know, it's a coincidence there. Here's the idea that, 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 that comes to mind when I think of the gulag system as a form of re-education. The Jewish-owned Comedy Central, um, uh, cable television network. Now, I don't have cable, but many years ago I used to have it, and I used to watch it. And they have this thing called the Blue Collar Comedy Tour. And, you know, it's actually very funny. They're very, very talented guys on here. Of course, Jeff Foxworthy is on that. And, um, you know, I, I always wondered, you know, the, the leftist idea was to mobilize the blue collar. The leftist idea was to make the blue collar workers the basis and the nexus of a new society. Now, 2005, 2009, they are mocking these people. They are called ignorant and they're yokels and they're all racist and they're all evil. Uh, which, you know, the, the, the implication is that they should be sent into the camps. Uh, the fact is, is that the American blue collar worker has rejected Marxism. In the 1930s and 40s in America, it was understood that maybe the American blue collar worker will become a communist, and therefore we could use them as cannon fodder in creating the, the new society. But by 1990, uh, 2000, the fact is that the American blue-collar worker was not only anti-communist, but extremely nationalist, Christian, vaguely speaking, and patriotic. So it should be no surprise that from the Jewish leftist point of view, or even just from the leftist point of view in general, that the blue-collar mentality is something now to be made fun of. And that, that whore, that disgusting, filthy person, uh, Jeff Foxworthy, uh, is being used and paid millions of dollars a week to be really the focal point of this mockery of the white rural worker. Uh, low paid, uh, you know, no union, no protection, uh, an oppressed person who has rejected Marxism now is the object of mockery. But what is the connection? In the Soviet Union, the fact is, is that the communists realized that once they took over in the mid-20s, the working class, generally speaking, did not support the explicit, you know, the very um, esoteric, doc I really should say the esoteric doctrine of Marxism. And therefore, because they did not accept it, they needed to be forced to accept it. And therefore, they were sent to the factories 
under the control of the commissars. They were herded into the um, collective farms under the control of the commissars and everything else. The relation is exactly the same. The fact is, is that the working class, whether it be um, uh, agrarian or uh, mechanical, they do want control of their lifestyle. They do want a control of the of the decision making of the factory. But they do not want the control of the state, of the party, of the communist movement, or whatever you want to call it. So the mentality here in the gulag system is exactly the same as you see in the uh, American Jewish television. The fact is, is that when I first watched the blue collar comedy tour, and all of this blue collar comedy that's led by that guy, uh, Jeff Foxworthy and those other whores who, uh, you know, quite frankly need to have the, the, the hell kicked out of them. Uh, uh, that, you know, these guys represent to the establishment mind the working class that has rejected them. The working class wants their own land. They want their own home. They want their own autonomy. But that's about the last thing that the state wants to give them, whether it be the capitalist or the socialist state. It makes no difference. It's one in the same thing. And therefore, in the Soviet Union, this exact same phenomena existed. And so the gulag system was a way to get this blue-collar group or, I mean, I'm, I'm putting agricultural and mechanical arts, you know, kind of together, uh, in, in the blue collar mentality, that they needed to be re-educated. And so, as they're working within this, um, uh, uh gulag uh, system, uh, they are being propagandized. And as they're working, they have a series of loudspeakers that are, uh, blaring 24 hours a day, concerning the brilliance of communism, the brilliance of liberalism, the brilliance of Lenin and all of his successors and the nature of the revolution. The fact is is that you are an idiot because you reject Marxism. And in that kind of pseudo-intellectual language that you will hear in academia, this is what is called false consciousness. False consciousness in the Marxist mentality means that you're um, you, you're a worker. You reject Marxism. Therefore, you have false consciousness. This false consciousness means that you don't accept Marxism because you are either an idiot, that you are you or you are retarded, or that somehow you're being manipulated by something else, like religion or by ideology or something else. And so, the Gulag system was designed to eliminate this so-called false consciousness. Don't underestimate how powerful the concept of false consciousness meant uh, within the Marxist system in general and the Soviet system in particular because it justified the gulag system. The gulag system was meant to take people who were of working class uh, status but who did not accept the Soviet system and then re-educate them or brainwash them into believing that the Soviet Union and the intellectuals and the academics had your best interests at heart. That's the fundamental theoretical and psychological nature of the gulag system. Now, more practically, what that meant is that in economic terms, the gulag system at any given moment had between 10 and 30 million people within it. But all of these workers, whether they be intellectual or scientific or, or you know, or, or physical or whatever, whatever kind of labor you have, you have a substantial percentage of the Soviet economic uh, labor force within the gulag system at every, at, at any given moment. And therefore the Soviet economy is the gulag economy. So whenever you read statistics, from the American government concerning the Soviet economy at any given time up until the 1970s, you have to eliminate, you know, maybe 70% of that as explicitly slave labor. And yet, you know, when I was in college and grad school, the Marxist Soviet economy was always acceptable as an, uh, as an alternative of how to organize the economic system.
and you know, and, and I began when I was at Mount St. Mary's, I lectured on these topics. And the, the, the louder I got on these topics, the more that I was threatened by the administration and eventually fired from that institution. So it's not just me. There's plenty of people who are suffering from this, uh, from this, from this issue. The point is, is that the gulag system was a method of brainwashing and as the Soviets and the Americans call it, re-education. Now, one of the most violent and sick, you know, uh, literally, of the gulag camps was uh, the series of camps that were involved in building the Baltic Sea Canal. Now, the Baltic Sea Canal is a Masonic project in that it was first developed by the Amsterdam Masonic Lodges uh, at the very end of the 17th century. Now, Peter the Great was there, Peter the First, uh, so-called Tsar of Russia, uh, Peter the Great was in Amsterdam at that, pati- uh, that particular period of time and was, and was um, initiated into the Masonic Lodge there. He comes back to Russia, and one of the first things he does is he demands the creation of this Baltic Sea Canal to connect the northern Russian rivers r- with the Baltic Sea and therefore the Atlantic Ocean. The problem is, and by the way, St. Petersburg is built upon this very same project. So the Baltic Sea Canal, uh, a project probably throughout Russian history and Soviet history, cost the lives of roughly a million people at one time or another. Between 1931 and 1933, uh, the Communist Party and the NKVD uh, which really at this time, by the way, had really no leader. Stalin had not uh, as yet really ensconced himself in power, had roughly 100,000 forced laborers working on it. But even in the beginning of the 18th century, Peter the Great also had roughly 80,000, 100,000 Cossacks from Ukraine working on this very same thing, the Baltic Sea Canal. But what is the Masonic connection? The Masonic connection here, and this was very dear to the to the trading, uh, the trading classes of Amsterdam at the beginning of the 17th century. Or excuse me, the 18th century, in the very early uh, years of Peter the Great, is to conquer nature. This part of the world, the Baltic Sea Canal, uh, is a swampy. It is freezing cold. It is uninhabitable, and it just so happens to be the seat of St. Petersburg itself. It is, in Masonic terms, and I'm borrowing some of this mentality from these ideas from from Mike Hoffman's work and and from some others, a lot of Russian uh, anti-Masonic writers as well, uh, uh, that that this is an example of man's domination of nature, of the idea that uh, the the mentality of the elite can control even the most violent and non-cooperative of natures. And there's no more non-cooperative nature in the world than this universe of the Baltic Sea Canal in the extreme north um, northwestern section of uh, of of Russia. Now, so beyond that, so you're talking about, I mean, at at one time or another, from Peter the Great to the beginning of the reign of Joseph Stalin, you're talking about several million Russians and others murdered uh, in forced labor just on that single canal project. So, you know, you wonder, you know, know, why are the Masons, why is this so-called scientific mentality so terrible? Well, here's an example of it. But in general, after the 1930s, well, during and after the 1930s, uh, for the most part, the um, uh, uh, the Gulag system it will be concentrated uh, to the east of the Baltic Sea Canal area, and they'll be concentrated roughly around the Ural Mountains and points east of that. That's for a few reasons. Number one, that it really won't be detected, and number two, that in case of the invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, the uh, big manufacturing interests of the USSR will not be affected. And by the way, uh, Stalin couldn't have been more correct. Because when Adolf Hitler invaded the USSR in, uh, 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 in, in the early 40s, the fact of the matter is, is that he had no clue 
that a huge proportion of Russian infantry and Russian uh, industrial uh, uh, rationality existed beyond the Ural Mountains. And therefore, when he made his plans to invade the Soviet Union, when Operation Barbarossa was in its, in its embryonic stages, Hitler had absolutely, positively no idea that the bulk of what Stalin had to offer was to the east of the Urals. And so he's making his plans relative to what is west of the Urals, which is substantial and, you know, certainly cannot be, uh, you know, understated, but was only a fraction of what he had to deal with. Okay. That being said, December 1st, first week of December 1934, you have the so-called murder of Kirov. Kirov is murdered at the order of Stalin. And, and, and we all know that the Kirov murders, uh, are really the first kind of, um, uh, they're the first real punch in this, in this attempt to purge Soviet society. The murder of Kirov means that Stalin and the NKVD and Beria, who is the head of the NKVD at the time, of course, now has the excuse to engage in a massive purge of the Soviet system. The murder of Kirov in 1934 is central for another reason. It was the Kirov murder that permits Beria and the NKVD to fill the camps. Why is this important? This is important because by 1934, we're talking about the end of 1934, the, the midst of the Russian winter in 1934, the Soviet economy is an absolute disaster. The Russians are looking at another freezing winter, and there is nowhere for that economy to go. Therefore, Stalin needs to create a, uh, a, 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 um, a diversion, and the Kirov mur- murder is that diversion. Beyond that, though, it's more than just a diversion. Stalin needs an excuse now to fill the forced labor camps with workers, skilled workers, intellectuals, mechanics, people who know what they're doing so that they can get the USSR through the winter. It's not an accident that the Kirov murders exist or are or, or, or purported to exist at the command of the MVD uh, December 1st through December uh, roughly 6th, 7th, 8th of 1934. It's the beginning, or I should say really the middle of the winter of the Soviet Union. The fact is that Stalin is of the opinion that the USSR will not be able to get through the winter of 1934 unless he is able to saturate the camps with people who are competent in the mechanical arts. So the Kirov murders really are the beginning of this central, very powerful period of the Gulag system. And so these murders will begin the purges, but the purges don't mean anything from an economic point of view unless you recognize that the purges are connected with the fact that by 1934, Stalin did not believe that his economic system could bring the Russians through that winter or the winter after that. Therefore, he needed an excuse to fill the gulag system filled with competent, literate, and intelligent people. Okay, I know this is, uh, <laughs> this is depressing material. Uh, let's take a break and we will, uh, finish up this very depressing topic when we get back. God bless and hang in there. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Uh, we have been talking about the gulag system in, uh, the Soviet Union, its purpose, and its, its, um, uh, the, the nature of the gulag tyranny. I want to make clear to everybody uh, that uh, the, the the word gulag, of course, is a acronym, and very loosely speaking, it's an acronym that stands for the main directorate for uh, corrective labor camps. So we're talking about labor backing the Soviet economy, but also the concept of uh, correctiveness, the idea of correcting um, faulty. Uh, uh, political attitudes and making them into correct political attitudes, which of course at the time was pro-Soviet. Um, but as early as night, now, where we left off before the break, we're talking at the murder of Kiev at the very end of 1934. 
But it is the case that as early as, as, as the mid 1920s, you have 84 officially registered forcible labor camps in existence. So you have a period where the Soviet Union has barely been able to establish itself as a political entity, and yet officially you have 84 gulag camps in existence. Therefore, it's not crazy to say that the Soviet economy, the second half of the 1920s, is in fact a gulag economy. And this is exactly the economy that the American press and that the American and British academics were going back to their university classrooms, uh, uh, you know, with their large salaries and everything else, saying, this is the wave of the future, this gulag system. And it shows you the absurdity of 20th century history, where you have these pious condemnations of Hitler's forced labor camps. But not only do you have no problem with Stalin's camps, or Lenin's camps for that matter, but the open, official, uh, uh, publicly financed praise of Lenin's and Stalin's forced labor camps. And it also should be noted that the idea of the gulag system is in fact... Uh, Lenin's creation, not Stalin's creation. Stalin uh, put it on a more scientific footing. He made it a more systematic enterprise. But the fact of the matter is that Lenin uh, had created it. Now, it is to be understood that by 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 the time Lenin uh, by the time Lenin gets sick in the early 1920s, that the Gulag system is designed to be the very heart and spine of the Soviet economy. That means that the gulag system is to be at the heart of mining, lumber, railways, and canals throughout the USSR. That is to say, the very heavy industry, the, 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 um, the uh, kind of, um, the very kind of uh, fundamental infrastructure necessary for the building of a so-called modern economy is in the USSR going to be created by the gulag system? I mean, you don't even see this in the textbooks of the USSR. The gulag system is the Soviet economy. It's not so much a part of the economy. It's not so much an appendage to the economy. It's the very heart and spine of the economy. But I'm going to tell you something else. The gulag system by 1930 not only is the spine of the Soviet economy, is the very nature of Marxism as an ideology, but is also the primary source of the wealth of the Soviet secret police. In other words, the NKVD, and later on the KGB, will have its basis, basis, its wealth, its financial resources exclusively, not from the Soviet government, but from the Gulag system. The NKVD is not only the administrator of the Gulag system, but the Gulag system finances the NKVD. As far as Ukraine is concerned, uh, the Gulag system was extended into south, uh, southwestern Russia Uh, as a method of destroying Ukrainian nationalism. Stalin used the gulag system to do several things. Number one, to destroy the yeoman farmer of Ukraine. The yeoman farmer is like it is to any centralized economic and political system. The yeoman farmer is a threat to centralized control. But uh, the the system is also uh, extended into Ukraine with the idea of destroying any uh, uh, organized intellectual manifestation of Ukrainian nationalism. But even worse than that, Stalin. W- we all know that in the, in you know thirty three thirty six, Stalin will starve. Uh, by a deliberate blockade policy of Ukraine with the support of the American government and certainly the New York Times who will actually perform uh, cover 
uh, your sort of, you know, diplomatic immunity to Stalin's system will attempt to surround and destroy Ukrainian agriculture. Now, the point of that is easy enough. I mean, you know, it's simple enough in the sense that Stalin thinks that in doing this, he will destroy Ukraine, he will destroy the Ukrainian yeoman farmer, and therefore he will uh, destroy uh, any concept of Ukrainian nationalism. But what else? It really, even you know, the most important thing that Stalin has has on his mind is that he is going to um, he is going to uh, uh, utilize the land of Ukraine to his own personal interest. The fact of the matter is simply this, and again, you will not find this in any even the very good uh, textbooks on Ukrainian and Russian history. But the uh, the forcible starvation of Ukraine in the 1930s will lead to a to an increase in the Ukrainian grain quota by 44 percent. Well, how is that possible? That that's the well. Here's the thing: Joseph Stalin realized that he can increase the quota of Ukrainian grain. Uh, grown um, on Ukrainian black soil by pro-Soviet uh, communes or collectives only by destroying the Ukrainian yeoman farmer. So while you have Ukrainians starving in huge numbers, huge numbers, numbers that are backed up by the Red Cross, backed up even by the U.S. government, although the New York Times had went out of its way to deny Stalin's crimes in Ukraine. The fact of the matter is, is that in destroying the yeoman farmer, most of central Ukraine starved to death. But that also meant that the remaining land was then easy prey for Stalin's um, uh, collective farms, and therefore, given the situation in the rest of Ukraine, Stalin was able to force the increase of crops, uh, rye, oats, grain, including, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, living, you know, um, you know, cattle and, and, and goats and everything else by almost 50% in the process. So here's the thing. The idea of the gulag system and the starvation system in Ukraine is designed not to cripple Ukraine as a part of the Soviet Union, but to cripple Ukraine as a political entity. In other words, the point of starving most of central Ukraine, the point of starving central Ukraine, the point of all of this, is to uh, permit the eventual uh, drafting of the Ukrainian agricultural population into the collective farm. Therefore, the yeoman farmer, the most productive, patriotic, individualistic farmer in Ukraine, was starved to death in this period of time. And so, ultimately, what you have is, uh, you know, this, this starvation of the Ukrainian population is not random. It's designed to do a whole bunch of things. It's designed to destroy nationalism. It's designed to destroy individualism. It's designed to destroy the family farm. It's designed to destroy any sense that Ukraine should be independent of the USSR. And once those elements are destroyed, whatever is left over can then be drafted into the collective farm of the USSR. That's how the mass starvation techniques can actually increase Ukrainian grain yields by 44% between 1933 and 1936. What is insane is made sane by Soviet political ideology. Ultimately, of course, 6.7 million people were murdered with the open support of the U.S. government. The U.S. government was consistently at this period of time assisting the, the, the Soviet Union economically, financially, in terms of, of, of mechanics, in terms of science and skilled labor and everything else. That's the fact of the matter. Okay, but that's not the only fact of the matter. There were other elements in Ukrainian society in the 1930s that needed to be dealt with. 
The one element was the German population. Stalin had a problem with the small but very significant German population of Ukraine, and they were deported violently and dispersed throughout the Soviet Union. Furthermore, the Crimean Tartars. These are Mongols, Oriental peoples, who were generally uh, supportive of Russian nationalism, and actually still are today, and the Crimea, uh, the Crimea in Ukraine is generally pro-Russian. They were also uh, deported and scattered throughout the rest of the Soviet Union. Any anti-Soviet uh, uh, element was either destroyed, starved, or scattered throughout the population. And ultimately, uh, roughly two-fifths of the population of the entire Ukraine, whether Ukrainian or not, was either uh, murdered or uh, resettled in the uh, in, in in the rest of of the Soviet Union. So what what happens? I mean, you know, ultimately we know the story. By the uh, by, by 1934-1935, the Gulag system created uh, a massive famine for the average Russian consumer. The Russian state can say, or the Soviet state can say, that we have this huge increase of grain because we have brought everybody voluntarily into the collective farm system. But the fact of the matter is, is that the bulk of the population in southern Russia were starving. Secondly, consumer goods were non-existent. The only goods that existed were uh, concerning heavy industry, and those who controlled heavy industry were party members. You had a forcible move, because of all of this, from the land to the cities. So you had a massive demographic uh, alteration of the society. By 1935, Stalin, in the name of the liberation, I want you guys to get this straight here, in the name of the liberation of labor, Stalin, with the support of the Communist Party, uncoerced support of the Communist Party, will uh, uh, legislate an 18-hour day for the sake of making up for the losses of Stalin and the party's own policies. As this is going on in the middle of the uh, 1930s, of course, needless to say, the peasants begin sabotaging their own crops. Instead of giving it over to the NKVD, instead of giving it over to the Jews for no money, they will burn the grain, they will make it into alcohol, which certainly made sense at the time, uh, they'll feed it to the to, to, to the cattle, or they'll slaughter the cattle and eat the meat and give nothing else. The fact is, is that by 1935, the peasants are refusing to plant. They're refusing to join the collective farm. The American government is 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 outraged as to why the the ignorant Ukrainian peasant won't join the civilized world and progress into the new world of the of the uh, a factory style system of agriculture, uh, but they refuse to plant nevertheless. And as a result, the gulag is sent into Ukraine and. And, you know, the press releases that the NKVD will send into Western Europe and America will be, these are all rich people. They're all rich people who don't want to support the equality of, of the common man. By 1937, roughly 5 million Ukrainians from central Ukraine alone will be sent to the camps. You know, there's really, you know, in terms of factual information, in this day and age, there's nothing more to be said because uh, uh, scholars of any kind of integrity have long since opened up all of these records. Nikita Khrushchev himself admits to all of this that none of this is false. Nikita Khrushchev says all of this is absolutely true in the late 1950s. So there's no doubt. There's no doubt as to the truth of all of this. But, you know... In spite of everything, I want my listeners to consider, number one, why Western governments supported this, fully understanding and recognizing the situation. Number two, why American university professors 
who as a group are disgusting, I mean, are from the 50s onward, why they not only supported this, but, but went on to say that this was the very nature of progress, and then, worst of all, condemned Adolf Hitler later on for his own version of this situation in the fourth labor camps throughout Poland uh, and, and, and the German Empire. That's what I want my listeners to ask themselves. And when they engage in, you know, political conversation, political issues, uh, you know, this is the stuff that you guys should bring up. This is what the West is all about. This is what the Enlightenment is all about. And you could call me obscurantist and you could call me anti-scientific, but this is the nature of the situation. And the fact is, is that the Western world is one big gulag, even though they don't call it that, and you're allowed to go home to your little tiny apartment and watch your program television, and you can pretend you're free if you want to. And you can do that, because the system... Uh, really thrives on this collective mediocrity that freedom is somehow defined with you not being gassed at Dachau. And we know that that's not the case. I want you guys to think about all of this, and I want to thank my critics as well as my friends, and I want to thank Mike and Dietrich, and uh, I want to thank all uh, 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 Steve and everybody else who's been my friend uh, through this period of time. And uh, I want you to think about the Soviet system and the Gulag system and how it is being implemented here and now, as Solzhenitsyn said, in no uncertain terms. God bless you. God be with you. And good night.